Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, that's my name, Alex Tate. Um, you can find me on the internet at at underscore fresh underscore dev. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Any Canadians here? A few of us? Yes. Um, and I work at a front end consultancy there called Wrangle. And we're having a little hometown love right now. The Toronto Raptors made it into the NBA Finals and won their first game. Um, so lots to be proud of. Um, but we're also proud of our very first Canadian competitor in RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Brooklyn Heights made it to the finals, which happened last night, no spoilers. A little bit about me, I am a, a front-end web developer, and uh, this is my family, since people are showing families today. I have a human baby and a fur baby, uh, Avery and Trixie. <clears throat> but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about functional CSS and all of the feelings surrounding it. So what is functional CSS? Uh, just to get a lay of the land, who here has worked with functional CSS? OK, that's like maybe 10%. Cool, so you all are going to benefit from this talk. Um, essentially, it's just a CSS paradigm. It's a, it's a way to handle your classes. So the classes themselves uh, should be small, global, reusable, single purpose, and immutable, which I'll put in quotes because um, it's not that you can't change them, but the idea is that you don't. And the class names themselves should indicate their visual or structural purpose. So you can think of them like Lego blocks. Each class does one thing and one thing only, and the class name describes what it's doing. So with Lego, you might have like a green two by six. You wouldn't say this green piece is part of the wing of my helicopter. And just some sample classes. Uh, an example would be W100, so that would be a width of 100%. Uh, flex, display flex. BG black, background color black. So each one is only doing one discrete piece. And what that looks like in your markup is kind of long strings of classes that you compose together to build your UI. Um, so in case you can't see, the, this div has W100, which means width 100, W50M, which is a media query. So on a, on a medium-sized screen, it's going to be 50% width. W33L, that's going to be 33% um, width on a large screen. Flex would be display flex. Item center would be align item center. BG black would be background black. And PL3 would be a padding left three. Um, so you kind of compose all these things together to create the UI. And let's talk briefly about the name functional CSS. Like, where did this come from and how is it relevant? So functional has many definitions, um, but there's a couple that are sort of useful for functional CSS. Um, the first is of or having a special activity, purpose, or task relating to the way in which something works or operates. So it's how something works, so what's its purpose? And the second is designed to be practical and useful rather than attractive. Um, and you'll see uh, you know, from the markup I just showed and from some of the complaints people have, your markup isn't pretty, um, but functional CSS isn't designed to make your markup beautiful. It's designed to be um, useful and practical. And what's a function? Um, we're all web developers here. Um, and there's lots of things that a function can be. But with respect to math and code, it's essentially a situation where you have an input and an output. And something happens in between. And you want to be able to predict your output based on your input. So what puts the function in functional CSS? Um, rather than the classes being functions, I like to think of the markup itself as being a function. Um, so the idea is you're, you're inputting these classes, and you can predict what the rendered output is going to be. So if you think of the markup as the thing you're inputting into, and then whatever's rendered on the screen as the output. And any functional programming fans? No. Yeah, FP. Um, so for those who love functional programming in JavaScript, um, there's a lot of familiarity. So we have the concepts of immutability. Um, so with our functional classes, we want to declare them once globally and not change them. Um, single purpose, so much like a functional programming function, it should be doing one thing. 
um, so the classes do one thing. They're reusable, so you declare them on a global level, and then you use them throughout your code base. And they're composed, so when you're doing functional programming, you're, you're composing functions, and with functional classes, you're composing them together. Um, and there shouldn't be any side effects. So with functional CSS, you shouldn't be having to predict what the cascade will do or some specificity weirdness. Um, because things are global um, and immutable, you shouldn't have unpredict unpredictable outputs. So just to make sure we're on the same page about what functional CSS isn't for today's talk, um, I'm not referring to CSS component libraries or frameworks, meaning things like Bootstrap or Angular Material, where there's full-on components given to you. Um, those libraries often do leverage functional CSS as a part of what they offer. Um, but I'm just talking about the classes themselves, those discrete CSS classes, not full-on components. And since the word functional is in there, I just want to be sure everyone knows we're not talking about CSS and JS today. Um, love it, but that's not our subject. So people have a lot of feelings <laughs> about functional CSS. Um, there's the lovers and the haters. And uh, I want to look at both sides of the argument today. So let's talk about what people don't like. So the HTML can be ugly. You can have these long strings of classes in line in your markup. Um, people really don't like that. Um, and there's a lot of comparisons made to inline styles. But I want to make sure everybody understands the, the differences. So with inline styles, you can write literally anything. Um, and it will take precedence. It'll, it'll override things. Um, whereas with functional classes, usually um, if you're working from a library, you're going with a system. So you're not just writing anything willy-nilly. You're pulling from a discrete set of values that have already been defined for you. So there's a lot of structure involved. Um, inline styles don't support media queries. Most functional CSS uh, paradigms do. Inline styles don't support hover or focus states. Um, functional CSS does. And inline styles can only target one element at a time. Um, so you're directly writing it on the element, whereas with functional styles, you're, you're, you can use these classes on multiple elements. Another critique is the separation of concerns. Um, so there's a lot of thought out there about how styles and context um, or and content need to be separated. So your HTML shouldn't be concerned with your styles. Um, that's kind of where semantic class names come in. Um, the idea is that if you're if you're describing the style in your class name, that's that's um, that's coupling things. That's coupling your design thinking with your structural thinking. Um, yeah, so essentially, they, they don't want markup to be concerned with style. Um, but there's kind of this dependency direction thing um, that happens, where either your markup is depending on your styles, or your CSS styles are depending on your markup. Um, because when you have semantic class names um, that might say something like container and a whole bunch of styles, that's then tied to the structure in the, in the HTML um, versus having HTML with um, a class names like flex where you're, you're tying things to the design. So it's a dependency direction choice. You don't really ever have this separation of concerns, and it's kind of a myth. Um, and there's a great article written by Adam Wathen, who is one of the creators of Tailwinds. And he debunks this really well and is really worth reading. Um, but this quote kind of sums it up. Uh, my markup wasn't concerned with my styling decisions, but my CSS was very concerned with my markup structure. So another critique is that it's not dry. Do not repeat yourself, for those who don't know the dry acronym. Um, so yeah, you are going to be reusing strings of similar classes. Like There's patterns that you're going to use over and over again. Um, and that is a critique of functional CSS. However, where you gain is that you're cutting down dramatically on the number of times that you're writing the same CSS rules, like drastically cutting that down. So you might be a little more like wet in your, um, in your markup, but you're going to be extremely dry in your CSS. Um, so it's kind of a false critique. Again, it's, it's choosing where do you want to be dry. 
And then just the general concept of semantic class names. People really, really like semantic class names to describe the structure. Um, and you know, like with SAS, you can get into nesting things and, and really paralleling your, um, your markup structure. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is an example of a semantic class name where I have a, a container around some drag queens. It's called the queen container, and I've got some properties on it. Um, and it's really tied to the structure of my document. Um, so in this case, uh, with semantic class names, you're describing what it is, not how it works or how it looks. Whereas with functional CSS, you're very much describing how it functions and how it looks. Um, I want to talk about the word semantic. Um, semantic means to give meaning. So when you have a semantic class name, you're describing the content, the structure of the, of the HTML, and that's the meaning. Um, but when you have functional class names, like flex or red being the color red, there's still meaning. It's not that it's unsemantic. It just has a different meaning. Um, and when we think about the purpose of classes, really, their function is to be a hook for a JavaScript or for styles. Um, the job of a class, in, in my opinion, or in the opinion of um, many, isn't, isn't to describe the structure of your document, because that's already done in your markup. Um, so making it describe your structure, that's, that job's already been taken care of by the structure itself. So what problems does functional CSS try to solve? Uh, as Rachel mentioned this morning, CSS has lots of problems. Uh, we all have dealt with frustrations. We all love it, too, um, or we wouldn't be here. But I think there's kind of four main problems that functional CSS tries to address. Probably the biggest is performance and CSS bloat. Um, so there's the actual performance aspect. When you cut down the amount of CSS that you're writing, you're delivering a smaller bundle. It's pretty straight up. Um, but there's also the, the like dev time bloat, where you don't have to be writing the CSS. So on like a selfish level, it's kind of nice to just know how these classes work and be able to put them together and not have to spend a whole lot of time writing CSS. Uh, on the performance level, Adam Morris, who's the creator of Tachyons, which I'll be talking about a little bit today, um, he wrote this great article called CSS and Scalability, highly recommend as well. Um, and he looked at a lot of, of large websites. This is a couple of years old, so I don't know how current the statistics are. Um, but Pinterest, for example, has more than one megabyte of uncompressed CSS spread out over five files. 97% of it isn't used on the home page. I'd rather just try and send my users the 3% they do need. Um, so there's this thing where a lot of websites and, and applications have to load all of the CSS CSS in order to view a single page, whereas they don't necessarily have to load all of the HTML to view a single page. So having a little bit of bloat in your HTML is, is probably um, still a lot cheaper than having a lot of CSS. And just to show, um, in, in Adam's article, he clicks to some gifs where he shows um, repeated properties. So from Pinterest, he looked at where they wrote display none uh, over and over and over again. And this is just a small screenshot, but there's actually 200, uh, sorry, 626 lines of code in this gist, just for display none for Pinterest. Um, so if they had leveraged a functional class of display none, they would have written it one time. So scalability is definitely a thing. Um, when you are writing custom CSS all the time, you probably aren't going to memorize every single class that you wrote anywhere and look for ways to reuse it. And you're probably not going to search your entire code base for everything you could possibly reuse, um, which means that scaling out a code base means you're, you're just writing a lot of CSS. You're, you're having to um, continually grow the style sheet. Um, and that means that um, not only is it harder to scale as a developer, but your user then has to download all that extra CSS. And the other thing that can happen there when you're writing a lot of custom CSS is, especially on shared code bases, like probably a lot of us work on enterprise-level applications um, with multiple developers collaborating on Git, 
Um, and then you get into inconsistent values and patterns. Um, functional CSS, one of the main selling points is that there are systems that you follow and you agree upon. Um, you don't necessarily have to buy into the system of a library. You can create your own or you can customize a library. Um, but either way, you're, you're sort of agreeing on a, on a standard set of what is um, allowed in your code base. And then, yeah, so decoupling styles and structure. Um, CSS that's tightly coupled to markup uh, isn't easily reusable. Um, if you have, say you have a component and you've got your queen container, for example, and you're describing everything, it's really hard to reuse that somewhere else. Like, you have to put a lot of effort into abstract things. It's not impossible. You absolutely can. Um, but functional CSS makes it really easy to decouple these things. Um, so going back to Adam Morris um, and Lego, uh, when I used to build things with Legos, I never thought, oh, this is a piece for an engine block. I thought, oh, cool, this is a one by four blue Lego, and I can do anything I want with it. Um, and that is really the, the key concept here. And then this one from like a selfish developer time um, perspective, you're minimizing context switching. So when you get really comfortable with functional styles, you can just write them directly in your markup, and you can really predict how it's going to turn out. Um, you might occasionally want to refresh your browser and take a look at things, but you're not constantly toggling between uh, a CSS file and a markup structure. Um, it's just really fast to kind of put things together once you get comfortable and know how the pieces work. Um, and similarly, when you're in the browser, you can just be writing some styles in line in your, in your markup, and you don't even have to get into the CSS dev tools if you're using functional styles. Um, one more Adam Morse quote. Um, that, that article is so good. So it's CSS and scalability. Um, in a great system, there's a two-way street of information. If you look at the CSS, you can tell what will happen. If you look at the HTML, you know what the code will do. Um, so the idea is here that if you look at the, the functional styles that have been defined, you know what each one does. A class of red is going to be color red. There's no questions there. And then when you look at your markup, like I know when I see something that has PA4, that's padding all four, I know what, you know, in a tachyon situation, four works out to, I think it's one rem or something. And I, and I just get used to these things, and I can predict what they look like. So yeah, I'm not here to sell tachyons. Like, I don't work for tachyons. Um, but I do work with tachyons, and I find it to be a really great library to play with. And, and it does work for me in production. Um, I would recommend checking out their docs, because they're really, really helpful. Everything is kind of visually shown. Um, all, like, everything shows you examples of how to write it in the markup, what each class does. There's visual layout examples. Um, the docs are really great. So one of the things that's awesome about Tachyons is it very much is a scale-based system. So there's a font scale, um, a type scale, a padding scale, margin scale. Um, everything kind of breaks down into sort of design system scale thinking. Um, so let's check it out. Um, We've seen elephants and dogs and stuff, but I'm going to show you drag queens. So I made this app. It's some of my finest work. Um, really, like, super proud of this. So this is just a, a, a grid of images. You can resize it. Um, it's responsive. Really, it's just beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, so I built this first using sort of a more traditional approach. Um, so this is not a React app. It's not an Angular app. It's not componentized at all. It's just straight up HTML and CSS, just to illustrate the point here. Um, so you can see here in the markup, I've got the queen container around things. There's a, a heading with a div around it. There's individual images for each queen. Um, and then in the, in the CSS, Everything is, is written out in sort of the more traditional style with semantic class names. And towards the bottom, we've got some media queries to handle the responsiveness of the layout. And here, we're going to redo it with tachyons. Um, so first thing we're going to do is bring in the CDN. I would recommend importing the library if you're going to do it in production. But just to play with, the CDN is great. 
we're killing our old markup and bringing in Tachyon's markup. So you can see we've got some familiar classes now, Flex, Width 100. Um, there's some media queries on the images, Width 50 on Medium. And then this is the fun part, CSS. Pow, gone, all of it. Um, delete all the things. And then just so you know I'm being honest, I renamed the title to Drag Royalty 2.0. Um, and then we'll give it a hot refresh in the browser. And this is the same site, and it's still responsive. And the layout is exactly the same with zero CSS. Not zero CSS, functional CSS. So yeah, what do the lovers have to say? Like I just showed you, I don't have to write any CSS. Um, this is a false dream. This is not the situation. You are going to have to write CSS. Um, and I think if your motivation to get into functional CSS is that you don't want to learn CSS, that's going to lead to problems and pain. Um, in my experience, on projects where I, where I do use functional CSS, I'd say 50% of my components, I'm still writing some component scope CSS. And there's still some global CSS that I'm writing to affect the whole code base. Um, so it's not like a silver bullet only solution, um, but it's, it's cutting down dramatically on the amount that I have to write. And the, and the bundle size, too, because Tachyon's itself is only 15K. So yeah, the bundle is so small. Um, there's an article you can find uh, that's called 15K of CSS is all you'll ever need. Um, and that's a good one, but I also think that that's not really the situation. Um, in my experience, yes, you can save a lot of bundle size by using tachyons, um, but you are going to have to write your own CSS. There's going to be a good, a good amount of it. This is very true. I can work so fast. Um, once I got used to functional CSS, which realistically took me two or three weeks, like it wasn't a steep lean learning curve, um, I just find that I'm, I'm, I'm writing it really fast and I'm prototyping in the browser super fast. Um, it's just made my workflow really, really smooth. And reuse all the things. Um, this is very much true. So you're reusing this global style sheet that you've either created yourself or pulled in from a library. Um, and then you can take this one step further by componentizing your system, where you know, each component has a string of classes, but you're not duplicating that everywhere. You're just reusing that component. Um, so you're not necessarily having to rewrite the same strings of classes constantly. And this one is super, super awesome. I can think in design systems. So you know, having worked closely with designers who are also familiar with, C with functional CSS, I'm able to sit down with them and be like, OK, how do, you, you know, how do we want to customize the scale? Do we like the scale? Cool. Now that we're on board with the scale, how do we want to use it? And you know, somebody can just ping me on Slack and be like, mm, I need that to be actually like margin level five instead of margin level four. And it's just like the easiest communication flow um, because you're already thinking in the same system. And of course, that's possible with other systems. This is just one that, that works well. So, so what do I do in production? <coughs> On a code basis where we are using functional CSS, um, which you know is client specific, I, I do work at a consultancy, so I have different different clients with different um, comfort levels with this type of stuff. Um, but when I do, I use the functional classes as much as possible, and I reach for those first before I try to write my own CSS, um, which in the beginning requires searching the docs a lot and getting comfortable, but eventually you really just know what's up. Um, and then you customize the library as needed. You don't have to take it out of the box. I, I'm sure to componentize as much as possible so that I'm not having to rewrite the same things over and over again, both with the markup and the CSS. Um, and then when I have to, I'll component scope classes. So if I don't think something is reusable, but it is a specific situation where I need to be some, doing something outside of tachyons, I'll component scope it first before I reach for the global scope. And then when you do want to get into things that are reusable through your code base but don't come from the library, of course, you're going to need some global CSS for that. Um, in those situations, if I'm going to write utility classes that might be reused everywhere, I try to remember to prefix them. So in this app, I might call it like 
DQ flex 12 or whatever, like drag queen. So you're like prefixing things just to be sure that um, there's no weird interaction with the functional library in case there's a random class you're not aware of. Prefixing is just a nice way to prevent that. So just a few cautions. Learn CSS. Um, I don't think I have to preach to the choir here. Um, but as I said, if, if you think this is a shortcut to not learn CSS, you'll feel the pain as soon as you have to write your own and you, you don't understand what's happening. Um, so definitely learn CSS and use this as a tool within your, your palette of things you can do with CSS. This one I've seen, uh, don't import the full library to extend a class from it. Um, so there was a, a component that I was working on for a component library. So um, it was a, a drop down that was going to be used all over multiple products for a company. And someone had imported um, the entire library of tachyons just to extend a class like margin top two. Um, so tachyons is 15K. That means every list item in every dropdown on every product has 15K of CSS on it. So just, just don't do that. Um, if you feel like you want to be extending things, um, maybe it's a good time to be writing your own CSS component scoped. And this one's really big. CSS or functional CSS is super exciting and it's really fun to play with, but don't be the developer who goes home and then rewrites an entire collaborative code base without buy-in from your team. Um, if you're interested in bringing it in into your project, and I, I will say I've used it in production a lot and it, it's great. Um, Make sure your team is on board. It's a huge code style change, and you don't want to be doing that stuff and being heavy handed um, and just kind of demanding a new way. Um, what I'd really recommend is that you go home and try it out on some little silly side project, make some drag queens, whatever, um, and, and then show your colleagues and, and see if they're interested. Um, because yeah, that can be really destructive to a team vibe to just dogmatically make a decision. And yeah. Do you? Um, <laughs> this is not a silver bullet. It's only one possible way of handling your CSS. Um, there's lots of cases where I still write custom CSS, and I'm very grateful that I know it and love it. Um, try it out. Don't push it on people. If your team isn't ready, be chill. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, if you don't like it, you don't have to like it. You know, like Nobody has to do anything. It's just a, a cool thing to check out. Um, I want to thank CSS ConfiU for having me today and everybody here for listening. Um, and I want to thank all of the people who've written great articles about functional CSS, because I read about 30 of them in preparation for this talk. There's lots of great stuff you can find online by just Googling the subject. Um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, and um, I'll be sharing my slides later today. Thanks.